Salofa and good morning. It's a beautiful day to come together to worship our Father in heaven. Amen. Always encouraging to see the church family. Most encouraging also is the visitors. Thank you, visitors, for choosing to be with us today. Uh, you are a special guest to us. We have some visitors that are uh, coming back. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, there are several of you on Zoom, some new names that I haven't uh, seen. Thank you for joining us. If you have any question about the Bible or if you're interested in the Bible study, we also offer Zoom Bible studies for individuals. So if that's something you're interested in, please reach out to us. We want to help you with that. This morning in our uh, sermon, we continue with our training in evangelism. Evangelism is the work of the church, and we have been studying on this topic for the past couple months. Since uh, May, we had an evangelism seminar, and from that seminar, we have been uh, reactivated, if you will, as a church to focus our efforts on evangelism, to focus on winning souls just as Jesus came to do. The Bible tells us, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. And those who would follow the Son of Man would do the same, to seek and to save those who are lost. And we've been learning this Bible study method called Back to the Bible. Back to the Bible is three booklets, right? Now, Back to the Bible is not our doctrine. Let's get something right. Our doctrine is the word of God. Back to the Bible is a guide to help us understand the word of God. And so it's a, it, it's a uh, study method that, that focuses uh, the person's heart on the topic of salvation. In book one of study of, of Back to the Bible, the book one of this study, the message is on authority, right? When it comes to religious authority, there have been many uh, occasions where I've studied with someone and, and they view their quote unquote pastor or reverend as the authority in their religion, right? And you name the different types of authoritative figures in man-made religion. Well, in this study of book one, we come back to the authority, the final authority in religion, the word of God. Right, so you're not, you're not going to hear from Lima's opinions when you're studying book one. You're going to hear the Bible says where Jesus speaks to his disciples and say, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And church, if Jesus has all the authority, there's none for you. There's none for me. Right? Jesus has all the authority. And in book one, we learn about that. That we should listen to Jesus because Jesus said, if anyone rejects my words, there is something that will judge him on the last day. Jesus said, the very words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day, John 12 and verse 48. So if the words Jesus spoken will judge me on the last day, I need to know what Jesus said. I need to know what he said. It's right here. All right. In book two, the study transitions to the church that you can find in the word of God, right? I'll go down the street in California Avenue, Wahiwa, and I'll tell you I'll find many churches that are not found in the Bible. Book two brings the person you're studying with face to face with truth. Jesus said in Matthew 16 and verse 18, and upon, and I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, the confession that Peter made, upon this rock, I will build my church, the church that belongs to Jesus, the church that he purchased with his own blood, Acts 20 and verse 28, the church that he died for so that he could save his bride, Ephesians 5. 23 and onward, the church that is married to Christ, Romans 7, verse 1 through 4, the pride of Christ. That church in book two, the person 
realizes, wow, if we just stay with the Bible, the whole world who follows Jesus, if the whole world stay with the Bible, they will know that there's only one church. And so at the end of this study of book two, the person learns about the organization of the church, that you have Jesus as the head, Colossians 3.16, that you have shepherds, Acts 20 and verse 28, that you have deacons, 1 Timothy 3, verse 8 through 12. And then you have the church family. All right. Philippians 1, verse 1, Paul writes to the church in Philippi. He addresses every single part of the church. He says to the saints and to the shepherds or the bishops and to the deacons, greetings, Philippians 1 and verse 1, the organization of the church. They also learn of the worship of the church God did not leave the matter of worship for us to decide however we want to worship. But in the New Testament, we find the examples. The Christians sang songs. The Christians gave of their means. The Christians observed the Lord's Supper, just as we did this morning. The Christians prayed together. And the Christians heard the word of God preach. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, in prayers. When the church began, that's what they did in worship. Now in our study, church, we transition to the final book. That is book three, which is three books. And book three starts with this section, your spiritual Condition. Church, you're handling souls. When you're studying with them. And so you must be patient. You must be truthful. And you must be willing to show some transparency when you start book three. Because as the scripture that was read for us says, all have fallen short, all have sinned and fallen short, the glory of God. And so book three starts with the study of the person's spiritual condition. It's awkward. You ever had discussions at your workplace and someone was discussing something that is sinful and you're there and you're hearing it? How do you feel about it? If you're anything like me, you feel awkward. You feel like, man, I shouldn't be listening to this type of stuff. Man, they shouldn't be talking about this type of stuff. The discussion of sin can get awkward. But if there's someone who will be comfortable in awkward situations, it should be the Christian. Christians, we should be comfortable to talk about sin. And that's what this is about. Everyone has a spiritual condition as they stand and live before God. There are only two. There are no neutralities, all right? One, you are spiritually lost. A person who is spiritually lost, according to the scriptures, will be cast into the lake which burns with fire. Revelation 21, 8 and onward. So you have lost souls. The other one is you are spiritually saved, that you are saved in Christ Jesus. Those are the only two types of people in this world. If you think souls, if you're thinking souls, there are, or there are lost souls and there are saved souls. And church, you can do something about it. Maybe you're here this morning and... Your spiritual condition is lost. 
I plead with you. I want to help you. Let the scriptures this morning nourish your heart to faith that you may obey the gospel this morning. If you're here this morning and you realize, you know what, I, I'm spiritually lost. I want you to pay attention to the lesson. Maybe you are spiritual lost and, and you want to ask more questions. Let me know. All right. We'll go out and eat lunch at Liliha Bakery. And we'll talk about it. And we'll reason with the scriptures afterwards. Let me know. I want to help you. And there are people here that want to help you. Let somebody know. Let somebody who knows know. You get what I'm saying? So this study starts with this scripture, and rightly so. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, verse 1 and verse 2, all right, we're, we're in the show, not tell business. So we want to let the person read the word of God for themselves, right? You don't want to tell them what to believe. Have them read for themselves what they should believe. In Isaiah 59, verse 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot see, his ear heavy that it cannot hear. I want to pause here, All right? Every time in the study, I would rephrase this first part. I do it on purpose because I want to make sure the, the point is not missed here, right? The first part says, God can save you. That's what it says. Behold, the Lord's hand is not sure that it cannot save. God can save you. The second part is, God can hear you, right? Behold, the Lord's ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. God can hear you. But here's the problem, the second part, verse 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that you will not hear. I would explain the context of Isaiah 59. Isaiah was preaching to a people that was hard-headed. A people of God, God's people, who once worshipped God in truth. But at this point in the journey, right, in the journey of life, these people would worship God, and then they would worship the idols. They will offer to God everything that God had commanded them, and then they turn to false gods and bow down. And Isaiah, the prophet sent by God, tells them to repent, turn back to God. Notice what they were doing. They had a relationship with God. But God will not save them. Why? Because they love sin. God can save, but he will not save one who loves sin. That's the context of this people. God can hear prayers, but God will not, the, will not hear the prayer of one who lives in sin. Unless that one is turning from sin, God will not hear. Notice he continues on, but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you that he will not, that he will not hear you. Can you picture that for me, church? Picture that in your imagination. God turning away from us. One of the things we long for when judgment day comes, we long to be with the Lord face to face. But what if you see God and God does this to you? God looks at you and then he says, or, and then he does this. He turns away from you. God is turning away from a people that say they love him, but they were living in sin. And so Isaiah says, your sins have separated you from your God. Your sins have caused him to hide his face from you. So church, fill in the blank for us here. Your blank have hid his face from you. Your sins. Sin separates man from God. That's the principle in scripture. Notice in the picture. Sin creates that gap. 
between man and God. Sometimes I'll take the study to the Garden of Eden. When, a, a, when Adam and, and Eve sinned, what happened? God separated them from his presence. God's presence was in the Garden of Eden. When they sinned, the Bible said, and God was walking in the cool of the day. And when God had called them on their sins, God separated them. Part of the separation was there was another tree in the garden called the tree of life. And if man partook of that tree, he would be eternal. And God said, he cannot be here. You know where that tree is? Is in heaven. The tree of life. The book of life. And so we see from the garden even to this day, when man sins, separates him from God. The next verse we go to is John chapter 3 and verse 4. What is sin? Church, sometimes in the study, the person you're studying with does, does not know what sin is. And what, it, what, it, what I mean is they don't know the biblical definition of sin. They know because, because we grow up hearing about sin, right? And every time we hear that word sin brought up, we think about, oh, that's got to be something bad, right? It's a sin. It's bad. But here we give the biblical definition because God provides it, right? What is sin? First John 3 and verse 4. Whoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin, here's the definition, is the transgression of the law, right? Sin is a violation of God's law. Not, not, not man's law. Now, our, our government has, you know, it, it, it have some laws that we should live by. Excuse me, Romans chapter 13, right? The speeding laws, the tax laws, you know, all your favorite laws, right? Those are ordained by the government, and the government is ordained by God. Romans 13. So long as the government does not contradict God, you follow the instructions of our civil government. But sin, defined by the Bible, is violating supreme law. God's law. Right? And so, let me tell you what's happening when you're studying with the person as they read the scriptures. They're thinking about their own sins. When, when they are studying, they're thinking about it. You're thinking about your own sins when you're, while you're studying with them. That's where transparency comes into play. I'll, I'll, I'll mention more of that as we continue. But now notice we transition to... I'm sorry, I didn't let you fill in the blank. Church, what is sin? Transgression of the law. Whose law? God's law, right? We live in God's house. We follow God's rules. And his laws are not burdensome. They're good for us, right? Transitioning now, we, we go to James chapter 1, verse 14, 15, Right? Sometimes when people uh, think about sin, sometimes it's easy to shift the blame. The first man and the first woman created did that. When they sinned against God, they shifted the, the blame. They blamed somebody, all right? Adam blamed Eve. Well, in, essentially, he blamed God because he said to God, God, the woman you created, <laughs> God, the woman you brought, all right? No, Adam, you did it. <laughs> You did it yourself, right? Sometimes the, the people do that. We do that sometimes, right? When we sin, we, we, we sometimes try to justify. It. But so-and-so was the reason why. Don't do that because the bottom line is we are responsible for our own sins, right? You're not responsible for my sin. I'm not responsible for your sin. 
So I can't blame you for me sinning. It's a, it's a decision that I make. Get it from the word of God. Notice this. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. All right, I want us to notice something in this context. James had just mentioned, if anyone's tempted, don't say that God has tempted you. Because God does not tempt man to sin, nor is he tempted by sin. But when someone is tempted, they are tempted by their own desires, their own lust. Someone, if someone is an alcoholic, right? If someone is an alcoholic, and I sometimes use this illustration in the Bible study. Someone is an alcoholic, uh, and I'm not an alcoholic, and, 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 and we're sitting at the same table, and someone puts a beer on our table. Who is more tempted to take that beer? The man who has been struggling with the sin of drunkenness, right? So, so what tempts you may not tempt me. What tempts me may not tempt you to sin. That's what James is saying. We are drawn to sin by our own desires, our own weakness or weaknesses. No one can ever say, the devil made me do it. Ever heard that? Ever heard that before? Someone justifying their wrongful action. Well, you know, the, the devil made me do it. No, he did not. The devil tempted you. The devil tempted you. You chose to give in. The devil will tempt us throughout our lives. We have a choice to make, right? Two choices you can make. One, when you are tempted, you can give in to the temptation. Or two, the other one is when you are tempted, you can overcome the temptation is a choice that you make. Jesus is our example. When he was tempted, Jesus said, it is written. When we are tempted, we should go to what is written to overcome our temptation. But let's fill in this blank, church. Man is tempted when he is what? No, when, when Lima treats him bad, he's, he's tempted and drawn away, right? Man, man is tempted when he is what? Fill it in for me. Man is tempted when he is what? So can I blame someone else for my own sins? One of the most important things in the study is helping someone own their sins. Own it. Because you cannot lie to God. Own it. That's part of repentance, owning our sins and the willingness to turn from it, right? You will not turn away from something you have not acknowledged as a mistake. Because then you go on, you know, in denial, justifying your, your sins. We have to own it. You know, when David conspired, took another man's wife, murdered hundreds of men to cover up his conspiracy. When David repented of that sin, he owned it. He said to God, I have sinned against you and you only I have sinned. He owned it. And that's what part of this study will do. You will help someone realize you have to be responsible for your choices. You have to be responsible. Shifting the blame doesn't work. When lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. Right? But then James says, when sin is full grown, it leads to death. Right? We go down to James chapter 4 and verse 17. All right? We're still defining what is sin? Sin is a transgression of the law. Sin is an individual's responsibility. Can't blame God for my sins. Can't blame the devil for my sins. 
I choose to give in. I choose to overcome. All right. And then here's another one. James chapter 4 and verse 17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. If anyone knows to do good, church, and does not do it, to him it is what? In the blank, it is sin. Have you ever failed to do what you knew what was right? Now, let me pause you before you answer, right? You notice this study is starting to bring up some pointed questions. Well, there have been some, right? Like, do you believe? Do you want to obey God? That's a pointed question. The pointed question is designed to get the person to commit to the word of God, right? And so this one is a pointed question, right? Have you ever failed to do what you knew was right? Church, guess what the answer to this question was 100% of the time? Yes. Anybody here said no to this question? Careful. This is where transparency comes in. This is where you want to level with this person. Every time there's a pointed question, Christian, if you're leading the study, you want to level with this individual. Don't let him feel alone because this question is pointed to him as he's reading it. Have you failed to do what is right? Don't let it, don't let it end this way. Yes, well, let's move to the next question. Don't do that. You level with them. You tell them you, you have failed this too. I do that every time in the study. Sometimes in the study, some of you have been privileged to some stories I have about my past. I don't go around just sharing that from the rooftops. But there are times when I want to level with you and I want you to know that I don't have it all together. I will tell you these stories. Some of you have heard it. You level with this person. Because talking about the subject of sin is awkward. Talking about the subject of sin can sometimes feel like I'm just being condemned right now. Sin condemns the soul. Don't get me wrong. That's scriptural. But you level with this person because you also are not perfect. We are not perfect. And so we level with them. We tell them, you know what? I, I, I've made some wrongs in my life. I don't, I don't always get it right. There are many times in my life where I should have done the right thing and I didn't. And, that, and we will continue to struggle with that because we are not perfect. But the point of emphasis is defining sin. What is sin? When I fail to do what is right. It is sin. We transition now to Romans 3 and verse 10. Romans 3 and verse 10 says this, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. How many are righteous, church? The Bible says none righteous. If God was not a merciful God, everyone in here will be going to hell. If God was not a gracious God, everyone in the earth will have to face his wrath. But thanks be to God that he is merciful, that he is gracious, that we become his righteousness through his son, Jesus. The person here, when they read this, they, 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 they do feel a level of comfort knowing that they're not alone. Right? Knowing that, yes, the Bible says no one is righteous. But what about the good man who does all these good things and so on and so forth? Like Cornelius. Cornelius, all his good deeds were good, but they did not save him because he was not a righteous man. Until he was baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. The Bible says none in right is righteous. Continuing down Romans 3 
and verse 23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many have sinned, church? All. All have sinned. Sometimes in the study, I'll try to explain that the all here refers to accountable people. The all here doesn't include little children. If you consistently study the scriptures, there are some alls in the scriptures just like this. That is addressed. It says all. Yes, it says all, preacher. But it's addressed to a certain audience. Everyone who is accountable. right? Because children, they're pure. They're innocent. There are those who don't have the mental capacities or faculty to obey the gospel to understand or reason, right? Would God punish them in an eternal hell because they could not? So the all here refers to those who, all who are accountable, right? And children, they're pure until they learn of God, learn of sin, Does this include you? Again, another pointed question. All right. At, right after the person says, yes, I tell them, it also includes me. You have to level with them because they're dealing with this. All right. Romans 6 and verse, 20, verse 23. Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is what? Death. You serve sin, here's your payment. That's the idea. Sin is a task master. We are either slaves to sin or slaves to God. I want to be a slave to God. Because if I'm a slave to God, the promise is eternal life. But if I will be a slave to sin, I will receive my payment. It's death. Right? And this is not just dying. Death entered the world because of Adam and Eve's sin. But this is about eternal death. The second death is eternal damnation. Right? And that's the promise that sin has to offer to you. You see how problematic sin is? You see how, how why we should run from sin? Because of the punishment that comes from it. You sin against an eternal God. The punishment is eternal. That's the idea here. How many sins must one commit to be separated from God? Church, how many do you think? This one. Sometimes in a study, I'll draw a picture of how, how we view sin, right? You're out on the water. You're looking at the horizon of the Honolulu city and you see some some skyscrapers you see tall buildings short buildings tall buildings short buildings sometimes we view sin that way a white lie is this short adultery is that tall building robbing a bank killing another person we 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 look at sin with these different levels but when god looks at sin sin is sin doesn't matter what kind it is, all right? And that's the idea here. It only takes one sin. And we have many. First Corinthians 6, we'll look when I'll transition to some sins mentioned in the Bible. Right? Not all of them are mentioned in this verse, but these are some of them. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. 
I didn't say it. God said it. Those who do these things will not enter heaven. I didn't say it. God said it. Right here through the Apostle Paul. These are sins. And these are people. He names the people that are doing these things. Question. Will the unrighteous inherit the kingdom of God? They will not. And so at this part of the study, you, you, you got this person thinking about what sin does. It separates one from God. What sin is, a violation of God's law, not man's law, God's law. The consequences of sin. If I serve sin, the payment will be eternal death, eternal punishment. And then you learn who has sinned. All oh, have sinned from short of the glory of God. At the end of this study, as we continue, come back for the following. There, there are several more sections. But at the end of this study, there's, a, there's hope because God did something for our sins. God sent his only begotten son. Someone died in our place, in our stead, to save us from our sin. If God would have his judgment, and God's judgment is always right, if God will make his judgment come through today, that judgment would be all of us will go to hell because of our sins. But God is also merciful. And he did something about our sins. He sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sin. You're sitting in the audience today. You're not yet a child of God. I want you to think about your spiritual condition. All right, we've got to move forward for the sake of our time. What is your spiritual condition this morning? If you come to realize that you are lost in sin, I want to give you hope. This is God extending his hand out to you. I implore you, take his hand. You need to believe Jesus is the son of God. You need to repent of all your sins. Turn away from it. You need to confess Jesus is the son of God. Here are the scriptures. Romans 10, 10. Confession is made from the uh, mouth unto salvation. You need to be baptized in water. That is to be immersed in water and it's in it's in baptism your sins are washed away by the blood of jesus and you need to be faithful daily if you want to follow jesus you better count the cost are you ready to follow him all the way you need to be faithful unto death that's you this morning god is extending out his hand to you come take his hand we want to help you this morning to obey the gospel maybe you have done that and you have sinned and have wandered down the avenue of sin. Make a U-turn to this this morning. Repent. Come to Jesus. Recommit your life. Whatever you need this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.